Alright, it's no BS News Hour with my main man, Spooly! Na 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 just a break it Double or bullshit! Double or bullshit! Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Rick is actually back there right now selling weed on his phone. How, what a trip, how it all comes around, you know what I mean? Can you turn that light down a little bit, brother, please? Thank you. I, I, I noticed some faces. DEA's over here. That no joke. FBI right over there. Detroit police right back there. DPS principal right there. Everybody Rick never wanted to see again. Oh, Rick, it's a homecoming. My name's Charlie Laduff. I apologize for the voice. I've been uh, fighting bronchitis. I'm gonna try to get through it. Show's gotta go on. Nobody likes to hear the sound of my voice more than me, so I'm heartbroken. But this is... Um, one of the most notorious gangster tales in the second half of the American 20th century, if you think about it. Jimmy Hoffa poofs. This one we know. Paul Castellano gets wiped out in front of Spark Steakhouse in Manhattan by the underboss, John Gotti. Pablo Escobar, the life, the trials, the spectacular violence of that guy. And then, white boy Rick. That, that is a, that's a top five everywhere in this country, except Rick Worshi was never charged with violence, ever. He was never charged with ordering violence. He never operated a dope house. He was never charged with conspiracy because he never ran a narcotics gang. And yet, he spent three decades in prison. Was he a villain? Was he a victim? Or was he something in between? Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome home Rick Worship. Well, bro, I never drink before a show, but I always drink during one. I drink a Mountain Dew with you. <laughs> to you all. Cheers. To your children. Cheers. Thank you, God. All right, Rick. Uh, I wrote these because you paid, and I think you deserve some kind of order. But this is a really trippy twist and tail, man. So I think we should start by being honest. We have not rehearsed any of it. I've met the man once, we had lunch. So I know about as much as you do. Nothing's off the table. He doesn't know what I'm gonna ask him and I don't wanna have to ask him that much. Having said that, you said to me, we should get this out of the way right now. He got a hundred million dollar lawsuit against different branches of the government for scooping him up as a 14 year old. Some things he's gonna talk about, some things he isn't. I don't know what it is, so forgive me if we have to jump because no one wants to watch him take the fifth five times in a row, right? So, bro, first question for you. What are we doing here tonight? We're gonna set the record straight a little bit. So first, Thank everybody for coming. None of you guys had to come out. I greatly appreciate everybody that's here. My family, my friends, my loved ones, the people that I don't know, 
thank all of you very much. I appreciate you coming out. I appreciate you giving me your time. So I hope we could give you a good show and, and help fill in some blanks that you guys don't know about. So thank you all very much. Happy birthday, sister. <laughs> Sherry, I love you. Oh, you knew her? Okay. Does she even like her sister? She is my sister. Oh. Not my real sister. That's a little more controversial. That's just but some more. I this can't is my other sister. <laughs> okay, so again, set the record straight on what? What are we doing here? You, why? I know you, is your lawyer out there? Probably. He don't want you doing this, does he? No. So why? Something I want to do. I want, I want the people that support me to know my side of the story, what I can talk about. There's some things I can't talk about because of the lawsuit. I apologize. Hopefully all that comes out soon and we get it out of the way, whatever it is, good, bad, indifferent, whatever it is. Okay. I just want it over with. And everything here is brotherly, man. Like, don't take any offense. I'm not going to hit you, Charlie. Okay, man. <laughs> You wouldn't win, motherfucker. Uh, you've been back to the old neighborhood. That's how that clip starts. You're making a movie about your life. From the day I walked out, we started filming a new documentary. And uh, I've noticed, what, where you, where'd you grow up? Near Harpo's over there? Yeah, Harper yeah. and Dickerson. Okay. So that was my grandmother's house. My dad was born in that house. My aunt died in that house. And a lot of, I drive by there sometimes. You shouldn't say drive-by, bro. Right. <laughs> Take me back to 84. Let's begin with 14-year-old Rick Worshi. What happens? How do you get tied up with the FBI, your dad? How do you become an informant and they're asking you to infiltrate a drug gang? Because this is the 80s. And it, it was never about a drug gang. It was about corruption. Like, that's the biggest misconception. There wasn't infiltration of drug gangs. There was, they knew that these politicians were taking money from drug dealers, as they continue to do today, some of them, sorry. But corruption's never going anywhere. We live in a world where money corrupts and people take bribes and they're gonna, you know, we look on TV every day and you see people today, you see a guy get arrested and you see another politician three months later that thinks they're not gonna get caught. But corruption is going to exist till the end of time. And my case was more about corruption than drugs. It was corruption in the city of Detroit. I didn't realize what I was getting into as a kid, knowing that if you tell on these politicians or say something about them, that 30 years later that it would affect your life. Okay. So how did they find some blonde-haired, blue-eyed kid living on Harper? Hampshire. Right. Just get it all right. Um, how, how does this happen? A lot of people here don't even know. Like my wife doesn't know. My friends. Listen, it, 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 the feds see everything. Like they watch, they see. I was in a neighborhood. They saw people that I associated with. They saw things, you know, and I guess they figured out that they could use me in some way, shape, or form to get information out of me. And I was young enough and dumb enough to do that. And they, they pay you. Yeah, they paid. And your, your dad the, was the, on the The biggest, payment. that's bullshit. Wait, wait, wait. The, I, the, I the, biggest, the biggest lie there is, is that my dad got me involved in this, that the government blames my dad. You see this jerk off FBI agent in the documentary blaming my dad. He's the one to blame. He's, he, he got me involved in this. They did this. My dad didn't have anything to do with it. My dad never wanted me involved. He never wanted me to sell drugs. He's not here today to defend himself. So for me, the hardest part about walking out of prison was walking out, and basically my whole family was dead. Everybody that... that the people that meant the most to me were gone. And... That's partly because the government lied to keep me in prison. You know, if I would have came home in 03, 03, the, the parole hearing was the biggest sham in the world. There was, all they talked about was murders and violence and this and that. I had never been charged with any of that in my life. Then one of the cops that testifies against me ends up in prison with me and starts telling the truth about everything. Bill Rice, 
who was a decorated homicide investigator. I know Bill. I'm sorry, man. I didn't think about that. 30 years of law, it's a life. Nobody even knows that. You're a myth. You're actually a myth. And there have been a lot of lies. You were, you're a storybook. Listen, 80% of the things that have been said or written about me are lies. There's, there's people they say that I told on that are my best friends today. I never told on any of my friends that, that I sold drugs with. That was, we were all young. I don't brag about the drugs that I sold. I don't, I, I don't want any kid to think it's all right to do it. You see people go on TV and these drug dealers say, oh, I sold $100 million in cocaine. But I can show you a text where they asked me to borrow $300. So for me, I'm not going to go on TV and brag about the drugs that I sold or what I did. Listen, I did something as a kid I don't think any other kid can do. I watched a movie. I knew if I got to a certain place that I could make money. I found my way to that place and I made a lot of money in a short period of time. Should I have been punished? Probably, but not for three fucking decades. Let's hold on that for a minute. Should I have been punished? You heard him. Probably, yeah. Three decades, that's the point, I think. But I don't know where... There's so much shit out there, dude. I don't know where the truth begins and the lies end, you know? The, you know what? Sometimes I don't know anymore. Yeah, I, I bet. Let, let me just, one more, one more here, because you're a creation of adults. The man sitting next to me, you're a creation of adults as a kid. Did your dad know you were working for the feds? He knew up until the point that I got shot. And that was when he told them, stay the fuck away from me. He didn't know to what extent that they would pick me up and, and you know, maybe drive by and, and you know, things happened that, that a lot of things that happened were, were mistakes, you know, that, that people made and, and the corruption that went on. None of my friends set out. A lot of times the police would come to us for a bribe. We didn't seek that out. They came to you. They knew what was going on. They watched very well in the neighborhood. They saw what car you drove. They saw how you dressed. They would shake you down. It wasn't us going to them saying, hey, would you help us? We didn't need them. They were coming to us. I can't tell you how many times that me or my friends have jewelry taken from us or money taken from us for no reason. From the authorities. Yeah, absolutely. They'd catch you with a Rolex on, your Rolex would be at Ziedman's for sale the next day. I would call my friend and say, hey, bro, your Rolex is here. Did you pawn it? No, I didn't pawn it. The police took it. Well, it's for sale at Ziedman's. Well, then you can go get it. Yeah, you go buy it back. <laughs> it's all right. Fucking gay, man. You're my brother Jimmy's age. Same age. How old are you now? 53. 53. My brother be 53, God rest him. At the same time you were running around with the Currys, my brother was working in a rock house in Brightboard. Uh, Death Cat was the guy's name. That right, Frankie? Death Cat? Mama went over there and wouldn't get off the fucking porch until they presented her son. So that's where I'm from. We're kind of from the same place. But how come nobody in your life came to get you out before you lost it? You had a lot of time to think about it. Listen, you can't get someone out of something. I didn't want to be out of the streets. I love the streets. I love that life. I was 16 years old. I had 100,000. I spent $120,000 on a car in 1987. What kid wants out of that life? I had everything. I thought I had everything. You know what I mean? I, I, I thought I had friends. I thought I had women. I had all the money in the world as a kid. You know what I mean? I, I, I bought everything I wanted. I bought my first house when I was 17 years old. I thought it was a mansion. Now I look at it, it's a piece of shit. <laughs> so what were you doing? What did you do for the feds and what did you say? What, was, what were you doing? The main you... thing I did for the feds to get it out of the way, yep. I told on Gil Hill covering up a murder. That's what I did. And, and, the... and it was an accident. And I didn't know what I was getting into. Nobody set out to do it. It was an accident. 
I got caught up in the middle of it. They arrested an innocent person. I tried to help the innocent person and Gil kept me in prison for 30 years. That's the truth. My lawyer's probably gonna kill me when I leave. Yeah, fuck him. So. Fuck him, you pay him, man. Yeah. Well, actually, I don't, but sorry. <laughs> um, okay, so I can tell you kind of want to jump on that, so I, uh, across that, so I feel that. You are done when people, there are a lot of drug busts, right? There's information you're given, they're kicking in rock uh, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say a lot, like, no. I, when, did I mean, the feds, when did the feds toss you? When are you expendable? Like when are you, you about When I got months? real deep in the drug game. Go on. Like when I ended up like starting to move a lot of drugs, they kind of like, I think they pulled back. But they knew all along that I was selling drugs. They knew everybody was selling drugs. They, they knew El Chapo was selling drugs. Read, they, they know what goes on. I just picked a guy up from prison. Everybody in this room knows my name. A friend of mine got indicted in 1988 in the city of Detroit for seven tons of cocaine. Listen to what I'm telling you. Seven tons of cocaine in Detroit. Nobody in this room knows his name. And he got 11 year sentence. I just picked him up from prison for his second offense. He was Pablo Escobar's main smuggler. He was also the Lamborghini dealer in South Florida. I love cars, so we became friends. Yeah. It's funny, you showed, when I, when I first met you, you showed me a picture of the guy, and he's wearing the nice linens, and he's in a mansion in Miami, and he's driving nice cars, and I'm thinking, you fuckers just got out of prison. How do you got all this stuff? Hustlers. Hustle. Well, Either like, you got we'll it in you we'll or you don't. We'll explore that. Just got to be a hustler, bro. A lot of guys come out of prison after a long bid and they're not that savvy. You got to stay mentally strong, bro. My whole time in there, I always planned what I wanted to do. I always, I never gave up. I always thought one day I would get out. So <laughs> mentally, like for me, physical health, you have to take care of your health. But mental health is the biggest part. And, and Sherry is sitting here and, and a, a company I work with, Team Wellness, we're a huge mental health company in the city of Detroit. And it's something that's near and dear to my heart because mental health is a huge problem in, in our country. We, we talk about these mass shootings and we talk about guns and gun control. It's really men a mental health crisis. You start rolling on your own. You don't have a gang. You don't have a crew. You're moving weight. You're getting a few kilos from Miami, right? Yeah. Did you fly down there? Did, or, or were they driven up to you? Both. Like, what I'm getting at is Art Derek, right? Yeah. The guy had an airplane. Did you fly with him? Absolutely. Is he the one that named, gave you the nickname White Boy? Absolutely not. That's what he says. Yeah, a lot of people say a lot of shit. <laughs> That's why they're paying. They want to hear the truth. A lot of people say a lot of shit. When no. did you first hear that one? How did you get the name White Boy? I don't, I, listen, I grew up in a neighborhood. I was a white kid. Some people, you know, as a reference would say Rick. And they'd say, which Rick? White Boy Rick. And, but, but, you know, the person that beat it into the ground was probably Chris Hansen. Ah, media. Yeah. They're, yeah. they're the ones that, that brainwash society to call me a, a mass murderer, a drug kingpin, all these things that, that, you know, people believe what they read in the media. They put me at the hierarchy of best friends. I never, I never in my life was associated with the best friends. And you're from the west side anyway. They were, were, they were, were from the, an area that I wasn't from. Right. But here you are on the news, you put me at the head of a hierarchy of this crew that killed 80 people. The biggest lie in the world. They made a myth out of you. Absolutely. You knew how to deal dope. You decided to go on your own. Everybody threw you away. I was away. a smart kid. Yeah. Listen. You're, dude, you're a smart man. Li listen, we just sold 11 G's worth of weed backstage, me and you. I, I, <laughs> I Ain't nothing in there, motherfucker. Yeah. He helped me. Y'all heard it. Your lawyer heard it. He did. He's going, wing, wing. And I'm like, 
Man, they tried to lock you up 30 years ago for that shit. Now it's waiting. Now it's great. I love it. Yeah. We're helping people. We're doing good things. We're giving back to society. We're giving kids vans. We're giving kids shoes. We're doing things that everybody says that they do, but we really do them. Okay, now back to you being a kid. Cause we're gonna we're gonna get we're gonna get to all that. Um, so you're on your own. You don't have a gang. You haven't ordered anybody killed, right? You haven't killed anybody. Is this all true? All true. Okay. I had friends. We have some of my friends are here today. That that listen. When you grow up in the city, there's people that you call your friends, but there's people that are your friends, and the people that were my friends, we trusted each other with a lot of money, a lot of drugs or whatever. We never robbed each other. We never, but I have other people, other friends that killed their friend for drugs. So if that's what you call a friend, but that's what they did for, you know, a few keys of Coke, they blew their brains out. The circle that we had, we all trusted each other. We all looked out for each other. We were young, we made money and we lived good. So you're not violent, you're just moving. Listen, we all came from a very poor neighborhood. Yeah. Like, it's not an excuse, but we all grew up in poverty. We all wanted nice things, and we took the wrong way of going about getting the nice things. Right. You know what I mean? That, yep. that, that for me now, you know, I, I watch on TV and, and this fentanyl shit that's going around, and, and I've lost friends to it. And I'm not making excuses. I was a kid. I don't condone it. But it was an easy way for us, and, and we were young and dumb, and we wanted some money. We didn't think we were hurting anybody. Listen, people say drugs is a victimless crime. It's really not. Like, it, it, it's, you choose to do drugs, but you also have the provider of the drugs. So, but in the same token, if you look at it the other way, I've done drugs before. I did it one time. I didn't like it. I've had friends that did it one time. They had a love affair with it for 30 years. Art Derek being one of them. And I got to say, you know, I thought about you a lot, you know, over the years in small snatches. And again, we're going to be honest, and I'm going to be honest. And I said to myself, I could give a fuck if this dude's doing 30 years. I'm just being honest. Because... You talk about people dying from the needle and from the fentanyl, that's my family. And I know that cocaine is a death business. That the money around that shit is a death business. So if you didn't kill somebody directly, the business you were in, somebody died touching that. What's the pill business? Huh? What's the pill business? I know. I know, bro. Biggest cartels in the world. I know. 500,000 deaths since 99, one person incarcerated. Yeah, exactly. Biggest scam in the world. Exactly. Biggest scam in the world. You got no argument. But people, people take these kids from the inner city and they give them 30 or 40 fucking years. But these dudes that run these fucking pharmaceutical companies, they don't do dick to them. And they kill kids every day. There's people in here, their kids died from fucking pills. They don't do a fucking thing to them. And you see, and I take offense, you're right, cocaine's a death business. I've been shot, I survived it. But the fucking pill mills, they're way worse. And everybody accepts them because, oh, it's a pill from a doctor. They're fucking drug dealers. Everybody, I think, knows that, but nobody's asking for anything to be done. It, it, to me, I take it personal. I hate, I hate pills in the worst way. You ask my girl, I, don't, I try not to take a fucking Tylenol I, I, because I know what they do. They pumped all these pills in people. Now they can't get the pills, so they're running down the fucking Six Mile in Woodward to get heroin. Those people don't give a fuck. Jimmy Wahlberg right now is making a documentary about the Shacklers and, and this fucking, you know, oxycodone and all this. They laugh and joke about it. These kids made a billion dollars. It's funny to them that these people, they know how addictive it is. Nobody's locking these fucking kids up. But all my friends and me, we all got locked up for decades. Why? Because we're from the east side of Detroit and we're not from Birmingham or our parents aren't a doctor or don't own a pharmaceutical company. Or well, you're not connected. 
So, so we fill up the prison system because we're poor inner city kids. All these motherfuckers that locked us up, they should all be ashamed of themselves. All of them. They look in the mirror every day. They lied. Every one of them. But every day they wake up, they look in the mirror, they smile and tell themselves a lie. And go have a nice latte. Yeah. Yeah. But, but now some of them that used to talk about me, I can show you texts from state senators at one in the morning. They text me and ask me questions. But I don't blow smoke up their ass. I'll tell them what I want to tell them, but I won't tell them what they want to hear. So I want that to be clear for the record. You know, that's how I felt about it. The, the year that you went to prison, death on the streets, not death in your bedroom, not death in the alleyway, blam, blam, was 686 murders, which was a second highest ever in the history of this city, more than the war of 1812. But now that I'm looking at the circumstances, see, you understand, you're a myth. You know, you're- What, what is it now? What's what? the murder rate today? Oh, it's the murder In Detroit, rates, murder over rates, 300. The murder rate's about the same, but oh, okay. nobody knows that. Oh, over half, the, it's, it's cut in half, exactly. but half the people move. Exactly. So it's the same fucking thing. No, but it's come back downtown, bro. It, it, it's the same per capita. If you look at it, yeah, no, half it the is. people moved away. Oh, the murder rate's down to 350. Okay, half the people left. I know. It's common sense. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to hear it, Rick. We're back, baby. No, they're doing a good job. They're Don't doing a great negative. job. The murder rate's down. They're doing a great job. So, what, but then I find out who you are, and I'm like, wait a minute. I mean, I rolled fucking weed. You know what I mean? It's, uh, three decades. Three, so, it's, here's the deal. He's on the FBI payroll. He's on the Detroit police payroll. It's a task force. Then they throw you away and you're out doing your own business and they hit what's her name Kathy Volson the mayor Coleman Young's niece his favorite you're there you have a relationship with her is that when the mark comes on you because they're they're surveilling you now you're not the biggest guy in town no I listen why did uh, why did you get set up and I do believe he got they, set up they didn't like that I was in a relationship with her my friend that's sitting here tonight told me not to get into a relationship with her. I was a young kid. I didn't listen. But that was one of the reasons. They didn't like that. Was it also police knew that you were working to take out crooked police? Absolutely. They all knew. They, they knew. Listen, I'm sure there's law enforcement in this audience. And, and I was telling the truth I, in the beginning. That's I have, DEA, that's I have, FBI, listen, that's Listen, I'm friends with... A lot of good law enforcement officers, I have tremendous respect for the job that they do every day. Mm -hmm. But if you ask them, a cop doesn't want to tell on a cop. So it, it, it's, you know, they have a difficult job to do. And if they cross that line, you know, they might be looked at a certain way. So the ones that were doing wrong, the other ones knew they were doing wrong. They just didn't care. And so, you, you wonder, I'm not going to be light on him. I believe it was a plant, but you're going Listen, the drugs I was convicted of? Yes. I'm free. I'm sitting on this fucking stage. Right. I never touched them. I never put a box of cocaine in the backyard. Sh should I let them know what we're talking about? I hope they know. But no, they don't. I, I was convicted of putting a box of cocaine in the backyard, May 22nd, 1987, summertime, they asked me for my palm prints. I offered to give them my palm prints without a warrant. My, I knew my prints weren't on the box. I gave them the palm prints. My prints weren't on the box. They still charged me with the drugs. They got people to say, oh, I saw them with a box. I never touched the drugs I got convicted of. I'll say that now. I'll say it on my deathbed. I never touched the drugs. Were they yours? I was responsible for them, but I didn't put them there. So they were, they, they were yours, but... I didn't put them there. Exactly. That's not, it doesn't matter whose they were. I didn't do what they said I did to convict me. Right. I just find that interesting. That's, you hear me, madam? Like, he's, yeah, they were mine. I didn't touch them. 
They so, said so I put I don't a box in a backyard that I was in a traffic they stop that I got in this. They stopped that, you in a traffic. You grabbed the shit and ran. Nobody saw you grab shit and run. No. That you threw it under reports that they found eight hours later and your fingerprints were not. Never, nothing. Today, this would never happen because of these. Yeah. This. This would never, I never would have went to prison if this happened today because the whole thing would be on video. So then you get to, we had a law in Michigan, it was to get the tough on cocaine law where if you had 650 grams, which is a little bit more than half of a kilo, about a pound, if you get caught with a pound, you get life. So he was 17, 17, and, you, and they changed that law. And they changed that law, but they still wouldn't let him out. We'll get to that, but that's when you get 30 in the state penitentiary. Correct. Jeremy, can we roll this clip, please? Now we move into the incarcerated. You see how I kind of planned? This operation was called Operation Backbone. And the reason I named it Backbone I figured you need some backbone to work this case, you know. At that time, it was the most significant uh, police corruption investigation in the state of Michigan. And he called out of the blue, and I said, what's going on, Rick? He said, well, the FBI is here, and they want me to help them. They've said that they will help me if I help them. But if you cooperate on this undercover project and everything works fine, the best I can do is maybe take you out of state custody and put you in the Federal Witness Protection Program in a federal facility with other informants. And it might just be a better situation. And if you ever become eligible for parole, I'll come back and testify for you. The FBI wanted to use my relationship with Kathy to target the mayor as well as police corruption within the city of Detroit. And what you're talking about is no problem. Right. I got three Detroit police officers myself. That's okay, cool. all right. These people have been with me. You can trust them. 40, 50 grand. So we got a deal? Yeah. Yeah. Here we go. Here we go. Partners in crime, brother. Here we go. Willie and Kathy, along with Detroit Police Sergeant Jimmy Harris, were charged last month in an FBI corruption case alleging that police officers took payoffs to protect drug and drug money shipments coming into city and metro airports. Any other mayor would have been glad to have corruption out of their police department, unless your brother-in-law is the head of the corruption. And then this guy goes on to call me a stool pigeon. That's like an old gangster term for a rat. Did that put your life in danger, having Coleman Young call you a stool pigeon? Oh, there's no doubt about it. 18 corrupt police officers and politicians, as a result of Wershey's direct involvement in this thing, went to prison. And without White Boy Rick or Richard Wershey Jr., that never would have happened. I think helping the FBI with Operation Backbone was the biggest mistake of my life because it created enemies that I couldn't even imagine. I was a kid. I didn't think of the political aspects of it. Do you remember your first day in prison? Absolutely. Can you tell us about it? My first day in prison, you go through quarantine, you're stripped, you're, you're put into the system, so to speak. Uh, and I was on the yard that day on the phone and I saw a shank getting passed. And the kid on the end of the phone, he got stabbed repeatedly in the neck. That was my first day in prison. So I won't forget it. I was on the phone with my mom, watching this kid get his neck tore out. First 18 day. years old. First day. First day. I told Justin Timberlake that story. I got to help him with his last movie. And I told him that story and, and he said, I'll never forget it. I said, I'll never forget it. I watched it, you know? Wow. Where was that, Marquette? No, Ionia. Ionia? Okay, man, so you're 18, you're blonde hair, you're blue eyes, it's out there that you are an informant for the FBI. Why didn't you catch one in the neck or it, it, one it, in the ass for that matter? It, it really wasn't out there. Like, people didn't really know what I did for the government or, 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 and listen, a lot of people in prison, they love if you tell on the police. You're, you're, 
they know so many police, so many people in prison, if you watch now, there's so many people being freed, you know, for wrongful incarceration or lies that we're told. So people in there, you're kind of like a folk hero if you tell on the police. They, because it's exposing that the police do lie. So again, so we have it clear, because there's volumes of shit about you, you were never informing on dope gangs, dope crews, dope dealers. My friends that I sold drugs with are in the back row. They all have jobs, families. Yeah. They're, 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 they're my real friends that are still to this day my you, friends. You see what I'm sitting here doing? Absolutely. What I'm trying to do? Absolutely. That is what... I, I didn't stay in prison because I told on drug gangs or help. I stayed in prison because I told on corruption. End of story, point blank, period. I told on corruption in the city of Detroit. I cooperated against the wrong people and they tried to make me die in prison, period. Do you regret it? Absolutely. Biggest mistake of my life. Biggest mistake of my life. They didn't do shit to them. They never do, man. So, so why would I sit here and tell you I'm glad I didn't do anything, I didn't stop. They're still arresting Detroit cops all the time for corruption. I've read, they shut down our narcotics unit. We were the largest city without a narcotics unit because of corruption. What does that say about us as a city? Well, it's funny you say that. Because we could get into Gill Hill and all. You want, you want to, you Fuck Gill Hill. Right? You want to... <laughs> Right on. Fuck right on. You, you made Detroit's machine. You made the machine mad, bro. Um, you didn't get a parole hearing for 15 years, and you're entitled to a parole hearing every five years. Correct? Correct. You're supposed to be. Everybody but me. All right. I got a little... Uh, let me see here. You get your parole hearing in 2003. And we have a new prosecutor at that time. His name is Mike Duggan. And he writes a letter to the parole board in which he calls you, quote, a gang leader, quote, a violent kingpin who, quote, disappears witnesses, accuse you of running criminal rackets, and a full quote here, this is one inmate that needs to remain in prison for his entire life. Now, fast forward, you got out. Kwame Kilpatrick just got married. You got invited. Mike Duggan was there. That must have been interesting. Life full circle. What'd you guys talk about? The weather. <laughs> You didn't get out. How did you meet Kwame Kilpatrick, by the way? I met Kwame in prison and I looked out for him. Ask him. Up in Marquette. Standish Maximum Facility. Standish, Michigan. Where's that one? Where's Standish? Up by Traverse City, west side of the state. They got nice beer up there. Yeah, they do. It's a nice area. Have, um... Have you seen the movie White Boy Rick? Never. Never. Well, <clears throat> we have a clip. Spoiler alert. You do 30 years in prison. Can we roll that, please? That's you. Thank you. You gonna get yourself shot, not going on a stranger's door like that, kid. You're like your worshi, right? Yeah. You've made a baby with my sister. Who? Brenda Moore. You need to call and be a man about it. Look, I've only been with Brenda like a couple times. Oh, you take one time to make a baby? Besides, Keisha damn near as right as you is. Who the fuck Keisha? My niece, your daughter. Ricky! Shut the fucking door, will ya? Let all the heat out. Who the hell are you? You his daddy? That's right. Well, now you're a granddaddy. Be a man. Call my sister. If you don't, I'll be back. And you don't want me coming back. What's he talking about, Rick? I don't know. I chill with a sister. Ain't even wearing nothing. Ah, oh, fuck, Rick. Fuck, Rick. 
wow, man. Did that happen? No. Uh-huh. I have a daughter named Keisha, but that didn't happen. Really? No. So you had nothing to do with this? You washed your hands in this movie? Things happened. I worked with uh, Scott Silver. He's one of the, he is the biggest writer in Hollywood now, a very dear friend of mine. He wrote Eight Mile, he wrote The Fighter. He got kicked off my movie. He went and wrote Joker, the first billion dollar rated R movie ever. He just signed on the teaser you guys saw. He's gonna produce my new documentary. So, very good guy. The only person in Hollywood, he came to every one of my hearings, offered for me to live wherever I wanted to pay for a year. The rest of them never, after they got the script and whatever they wanted, I never heard from them again. So, but Scott and me have a brotherhood that, that I love him, not because who he is, but when he got kicked off the movie, I kind of checked out of the movie and they fucked it up. Yeah, they did. They did. That didn't even happen. No. Yeah, fucking Hollywood, bro. I, just, I could have told you. Um, listen, man, then write us a movie, please. Just quickly, I, we, you know... Write a movie for us. Prison. Prison. We just watch Oz. This, this is, uh, seriously, the, the, the man was a child. And 33 years behind bars for, okay, fine, he admits it. He's dealing in cocaine. It's a death business, but he didn't death anybody. 30 years, dude. Not, it's not always a death business. Uh, well, it's usually. Sounds good, though, it, for it, the media. It, it is when you're, like, moving in that kind of way. Not a, I, I'm not dead. I know, but. My friends aren't dead. I know. I know. Not but, always, bro. But, man, 30 Sounds years. good, but it's not always well, true. Just let me do some drama, man. I know, but it, it, I'm just telling you. 30 years, though. I've heard you say it felt like a death sentence. 30 years is a long fucking time, bro. Can you give us some kind of window or description or, I, I know it's a big thing to do, but prison. I went in as a kid. I was a kid. I was 17, my friend was 16. They called us drug kingpins and gave us life without parole. Who does that? We're the only country in the world. Listen to what I'm gonna say. We're the only country in the world that ever gave juveniles life for anything other than murder. But we also say we're the most humane country in the world. It's kind of an oxymoron. That is true. You want to skip the give me a day in prison movie? Listen, prison's a dark, lonely, dangerous, dirty, nasty. It's hell on earth. You're in America. You're still, okay, you committed a crime. You're still supposed to. You're supposed to be treated like a human being. A lot of times you're not. So they try and break you. I saw people hang themselves. I saw people cut themselves. I seen people get murdered. I'm fortunate I didn't do any of those things. You ever got hurt or abused while you were in the can? I got in fights. I got in fights. No rape? No, you didn't go after anybody? You didn't belong to a prison gang no I had my own respect I had my own friends I grew up with I was respected I ran the biggest prison store in prison <laughs> kept that hustle going stay sharp <laughs> um, I got some news for you dude you finally got that parole hearing what was it 2017 is that when finally you were to the parole board, you were granted, and then you had to go to court. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because you asked me to do this, and I, re I very much, I want to thank you for asking me to do this. It's a, a big respect. This is, so I decided to do some work, because I don't know a lot about the story. I called the old cops, the old precinct. I called the courthouse. Do you know, up to the last month, before you were granted that parole, that very high reaches of the city, you can take this to the bank, that they were trying to pin a 30-year-old murder rap on you? Do you know you still got people that hate your guts in the city power? That is a truth. A 30-year, there's no statute of limitations for murder, and they were, they were peddling a case.
they, they can pedal whatever they want. It wasn't worthy. They, they can pedal whatever they want. They can pedal lies. They can, they can say whatever they want. I was never charged. I never committed a murder. I never had anything to do with a murder. They were looking to make themselves look good for what they did to me. When I heard this, reputable, 100% reputable, it came to this person. This person went, get the fuck out of here knowing exactly what it was. So, in my experience, knowing you, I can fully say from that small incident that, yeah, man, there, there's, a, there's a gang out there looking to eat you alive. You, you know what I mean? Yeah, I love them. That my success, that's what drives me. I love pulling up in a $150,000 or $200,000 car and waving to them or a $150,000 watch, or, or living in a nice house, living a good life, doing good things. That's my fuck you to them. That's interesting, cuz, let's, let's get to your bottom. We have to go to Florida, though. You get paroled, and all of a sudden, they're gonna stick you on that bullshit. Uh, yeah, I introduced someone in prison, and they made up a whole story. It was great. Yeah, well, every stolen car ring, right? He's charged with that. He gets five years. Because, if this is correct, you got a 30-year state charge. So you're supposed to do your time in the federal pen, or the state penitentiary. But because you helped the feds with... Police corruption. They put you in the, I guess, federal, the ni nicer federal... Uh, uh, yeah, so they say. It's prison. Right. Yeah. And they kind of promise you you're going to get out all together. They lied. That guy's a fucking scumbag liar. Yeah. And nobody, nobody in Michigan wants Biggest to liar in the world. Mm. Is that okay with your lawyer? <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Sorry, Nabi. So you're in Florida. Um, this is interesting. Kind of cool. Uh, you talk about they put you on work. It, like you said, it just... that. that it, it, I'll, I'll tell the story. Please. <clears throat> yeah. This is a good story, man. So I get a parole in Michigan. Michigan made sure that I was sent to the state of Florida because they didn't want to let me out. So I'm extradited to the state of Florida. They say, oh, he needs to be in prison. He got charged with racketeering, this, this, and this. I get down to Florida. They give me a fucking gate pass and a chainsaw and let me go in society to go work every day. I said, I thought I'm supposed to be in prison. So I'm not going to lie. My girl's here. My second day there in the cemetery, what did I do? I reverted back to my old ways. I bribed the guard. I didn't want to work. I'm not going to lie. It's fucking 90 degrees in the summertime. Guys are falling over. I went up to the window. I said, hey, bro, you know who I am? We're in a cemetery. He goes, I know who you are. I said, you want to make some money? He goes, what do you want me to do? I said, I don't want to work like this, and I want to eat what I want, and sometimes I want to use your phone. He goes, give me 500 bucks a month. I said, give me your phone. I called my girl. I said, send him $1,000. I didn't have to work anymore. Keep going. Listen, that's it. In prison, you have to find ways around things. If you have a little money, it's easier to find your way around things. That's what I did. Keep going. I bought a Porsche on his phone. I think I told you about that. He told me he didn't charge me enough because I, I sent my girl a Porsche from his telephone. So I'm hearing this going, uh, maybe the car thing's true, maybe it's not, whatever the story's been. No, it was a, it was a, this was a legitimate car. I bought it from a Porsche dealer. She didn't like it. She sold it. <laughs> okay, man. Um, you're out. You're out now. You're out. I'm out. Yeah. That's great to see. Uh, but you still got all the trappings of the old life. You like the show. You, how many cars you got? Oh, God, man. Now you're going to get me in trouble. I don't know. Six. Six. Maybe more. I don't, maybe. So you still like the, the... Yeah, everything's in my name now. They can't take shit. Right on. Yeah. I pay taxes now. <laughs> <laughs> you, 
you still have that sweet tooth for the old life. Uh, listen, I love flashy things. I love nice things. I work hard. I just spent a week in Massachusetts launching my brand there. I work hard. I play hard. I live my life now. They stole 30 years of my life. So now I'm fortunate to live a good life and do good things. I also give back. I, I buy flashy things. I love nice things. But I give back way more than I should. And, I, and, I, and I'm not mad at it. But I help people because that's what I wish people had done for me. So, you know, it, 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 I, I have an amazing circle of friends that the cannabis industry allows me. And Kim is here somewhere. She owns Wayne Relief. Like, they, they, they help me so much. I love you. And, and if I call and say, hey, I want to give this kid a handicap van. In any other industry, I can't raise $90,000 in one day. In the cannabis industry, they all tell me, Rick, what do you want? And I gave the kid a brand new handicap van. I changed his life. And he couldn't be here tonight because he has COVID. So COVID does still exist. How you afford all that? How you get your money? You got somebody backing you? I have a couple of jobs. I work with a law firm out of Chicago, Hale & Monaco, as a consultant. I work with Team Wellness. I have my cannabis line. So I, I do a lot of things. You make a good living. I live very well. Gotta ask that. You know, you'd be, you'd be driving home going, let Dump Dan Nancy Mike make fucking six cars. What the fuck? Because some people think, like, you stashed all the dough in a house and somebody. No, all this is it. new money. You know what I mean? All this is new money. Say again? All this is new money. Yeah. This you know, is all legit money. Dude, when, when they publicize this, they go to me, man, what do you do? Did he hide it in the house? I go, how much could you hide in the house? I still owe my girl some money for the last Lamborghini, so ask her. Lamborghini, man. I've been working 30 years. Kept my nose clean. Motherfucker got a Lamborghini. First one in the whole state ahead of everybody Lambo gave me. Do you feel it happens to everybody, this moment, fame, notoriety, people care about you, when it fades and if those opportunities don't stick, do you worry having the sweet tooth for things to be pulled back into the old life? Never. Never crossed my mind. You're an idiot. If you can't make money in society, you're an idiot. You, you, listen, I told you we took the easy way. If you think and use your mind, like we were kids, we took the easy way. But I consider my friends, my friend here that, that went to prison, he's worked for Ford, I think, for 30 years. I think he's successful. He lives a good life. He's married, drives a nice car. He's got a beautiful house. That's successful. Just because he doesn't do what I do doesn't make him not successful. He stayed out of prison. He changed his life. That's a good point. You think... Uh I don't know, man. This is... You were white boy Rick, the 17-year-old. You were Rick, the prisoner who learned some things about life, and now you're Rick, the free man. Things are going well for you now. If you could go back, and I know this is lame, but it actually feels deep to me, would you change anything? Listen... Nothing I did was worth 30 years of my life. Like, of course, if you can go back, we can't go back. I don't look back. I look straight ahead. I, don't, I can't change yesterday, but today, tomorrow, next week, it's all up to me. So oh, that was the journey that I went on in life. Everybody in this room went on a journey. Everybody was led here today. So that was my journey. I went on it. I survived. I'm living good. So... No, I wouldn't change anything. And I want to say this, man. I mean, I might have said it early because I've said it a lot of times to people. My impression of a guy that's got a seventh grade education formally, and he does 33 years of his life behind bars. I'm thinking, man, meathead. But you're a fantastically deep, really authentic, 
creative mind. That's the, you are. And it's uh, really interesting to know you. I appreciate that. I want to welcome you home. Are you going to take some questions? Rick, this isn't a question. I just want to say you deserve all the good things, and I am just so happy for how well you're doing and so sorry for what you went through, but you deserve all the good things in life. Thank you so much. Rick, um, I, I'm acquainted with uh, the No Crack crew, uh, Greg Woods and other people. In fact, Greg is the one who got the eight uh, kilos of cocaine when he's, he's a lying piece of shit. No, no. Yeah, no, yeah, I, he's a lying piece of shit. I bet, that's why I always wanted to know. Yeah, he's a lying happened? piece of shit. Read the book. I know. What happened to the other He's a piece kids? of shit, bro. Okay. I, I, I know you work with him. He's your co-worker. The guy's yeah. scum of the earth. Okay. He lied to put people in prison. Not only me, my friends, other people. He's a liar. I hate to say that. It's the truth. I don't have a good filter. The guy's a liar. He wasn't, he wasn't a good police officer. Oh, I know he wasn't. He made you look bad. If you were a good cop, he made you look bad. He made all the good cops look like bad cops. Absolutely. No, another liar. You know they lied and you know they were thieves. Hey, Rick, I just went outside for a cigarette and the motherfuckers wouldn't let me back in. You shouldn't have went to smoke. That kills people. How you doing, Rick? Uh, I'm Tracy McElroy. I'm from the neighborhood. I was from 48205. I lived on Philbert and Dickerson. Go Tars, went to Denby. <laughs> So, really, I'm not here to ask any questions. I'm just glad to see you home and wow to the room. You know, I appreciate that. Listen, yeah. I'm overwhelmed by the, the, the turnout, and I wish I could thank everybody individually, but I, from my heart to everybody in this room, mm -hmm. I greatly appreciate you taking the time to come here, Absolutely. drive here, yeah. pay to listen to me talk. I can't thank everybody enough. I wish I could hug everybody. I wish I could take a picture with everybody. I love you guys. I always say I love my supporters and fuck my haters. So. <laughs> Hi, I'm your sister and I'd just like to know how you feel it's okay to turn your back on me and not tell the truth about yeah. all I've done for you and your children from day one. Listen, because you, dad would be it, rolling be, over. If, if you right be an now. adult and don't be a fucking an idiot, you, you might have a relationship with me. Okay. So Sorry, keep I'm it not, moving. Yes, ma'am. Keep it moving. That's a tough act to follow. See me after the show. <laughs> How you doing? Uh, I just wanted to let you know that I wanted to bring something up. Cause I, was on, I used to hang out on Chalmers and Island Drive by Omdale, and I was locked up in the old county jail, and he was across from us, and we didn't have no TV. And we looked, they said, that's white boy Rick. I said, hey, man, can you get us a TV? Not even a fucking half an hour later, we had a TV. We used to watch the, hey, we used to watch, hey, we used to watch the Fall Guy, comedy classics, the Three Stooges. So I came today to show my support for you, and I, I got you back. And we watched TV together. Yeah, we did. Welcome home, brother. Thank you for coming.